Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Glory Kickboxing Lockdown. My name is Todd Grisham. If you haven't seen me in a few months, I know I look terrible. I feel like I'm in an insane asylum with three kids under the age of nine. That's why I shaved my head. I'm getting more gray than ever. It's just been a downward spiral. But guess what? I need my kickboxing, and that's why you're here. That's why I'm here. And who better to talk kickboxing with than Bazooka Joe, Joseph Montalini, my partner and the former welterweight champion of the world. How are you holding up in Toronto? Well, I'm, I'm doing my best here. I mean, I think the hardest part, like you said, is not having kickboxing in my life. So I'm here. I'm training. I'm training more than ever. But uh, it's just missing that those glory events, top calling fights with you. Um, I'm ready to go back. Well, we're going to break down your first ever fight in glory in just a few minutes. But before that, how about our cavalcade of stars from around the world? Let's welcome in our glory insider. He knows our fighters better than anybody. From Amsterdam to the Netherlands, Dennis Corman. What do you got for us later on the program? Well, uh, we touch base with uh, some, some fighters, but one of the guys I touch base with, most of all, he feels locked. Every, every fighter in the world feels locked down like we do. But this fighter was, had the biggest fight in his life, probably coming up against Cedric Dumbe, the champion. He's the interim champion of the welterweight division. Uh, his name is Murta Grunat, and we're going to see what he's all about uh, from his home. All right, so we'll hear from the predator, Myrtle Grunhart, later on. And you as well, Dennis. Now let's bring in John O'Regan, our glory historian. Thanks for that cough on your first on-camera appearance. We appreciate that. I have indeed. I'm not coughing for no reason. I, um, yeah, corona. Uh, swept through my house. My wife and child beat it in five days. I got my ass kicked for two weeks. Um, I don't want to recommend corona as like a weight-cutting technique, but I have to say that I dropped like 13 pounds over the course of two weeks like seven kilos so you know there was uh there was some silver lining although i am now doing my best to pile it all back on uh well yeah it was rough man it was rough you know I've, I've had real influenza in the past and this was this was really 10 times that man it's, it's it's pretty heavy if you get a good dose of it so uh yeah you know we're all bored at home with the lockdown and the quarantine thing but it's a necessary thing man because it's the, the corona thing is not nice it's dangerous yeah, well, people People were telling me you were near death, and then I see you right now. I'm like, near death? He looks better than ever. I think people were hoping I was near death. I, I don't think it was, <laughs> <laughs> it was wishful thinking. But uh, no, like the, the, the breathlessness, you know, there's, there's an effect on your breathing where, like, the, the, the slightest little thing you do, you might get up and go and get a glass of water, and you come back to bed, and you're like, <gasps> you just can't catch your breath, um, which is pretty scary. Yeah. You know? So. All right. Well, hey, yeah. glad you're still with us. What do you have for us later in the show? Okay, so we're gonna uh, we're gonna test your knowledge. We're gonna uh, got a few trivia questions for you guys. See what you know, and uh, also I'm gonna relay. I was talking to Jamie Bates from the UK. You know, Jamie in his last fight he beat the former champion Harut Gregorian, and uh, you know he's looking to make something of that. Jamie's not like a big name guy, but he he beat the former champion who's ranked number two, and he's trying to parlay that into something. So yeah, we'll hear what Jamie has to say. All right, yeah, he's uh, looking better than ever. He beat Harut Gregorian in pretty dominant fashion. Can't wait. To That's hear a big win. That. Absolutely. All right, John. Enough air time from you for now. Let's bring in Joseph Baltolini and let's take you back. It was seven years ago this month you made your glory debut in Turkey against an opponent, Joe, that had 79 more professional fights than you. Take us through that moment in your life. Well, it was actually in his hometown, too, so it added even more pressure for me. But, uh, you mean, nobody really expected me to win, and that was the, the story of this fight. They, uh, Glory, at that point, offered me a two-fight contract, kind of thinking, well, okay, do this fight for us, and then we'll put you in another fight. But uh, I think I knew something here that other people didn't know. And a funny story is I was talking to the commentator at that point, was uh, Stephen Quadros of Boss Rudin, and uh, I told him in my pre-fight interview, I was like, I'm going to finish this guy with low kicks. And they're like, Joe, come on, with all this guy's experience, you can't finish him with low kicks. Again, I had something to prove here, so you see me always getting in there and chopping away at those legs. Well, this is Marat Jarecki from Turkey. You're fighting in Istanbul. And Joe, in the first round, look, he's taking it to you. Yeah, he knew I was inexperienced. And, you know, to, to him, I was probably a young little kid. I've never fought international kickboxing before. He's in his hometown. So much to prove with, uh, you know, his big career so he wanted to come and knock my head off and he buckled you a couple times you almost went down how hard did he hit you well he did have some good power if you look at his knockout percentage it was crazy it was over 80 percent of his fights came by knockout but 
this was the eye opening for kickboxing for me where I mean before that I kind of my fights were in Muay Thai so I was able to use my clinch and and kind of defend these big power punches but this was the the eye awakening power and the excitement of kickboxing so I really had to learn that close range fighting very quickly only eight professional fights for you whoa there he staggered you Joe, watching this fight back right now, if you're a betting man, you're probably getting a thousand to one odds that you don't win this fight. Oh yeah, I mean, not any, nobody expected me to win. All all fight week, people were looking at me, kind of giving me a weird look, kind of you know, giving me zero chance. I mean, from the commentators, from the other fighters, and even Derechi, even in our post fight inter in our pre fight interviews, and he just had a little smirk, a smile. I, I think to him it was a big embarrassment, to be honest with you. Now, when you watch this fight, oh, there it is. A quick shot. Yep. Was that a left hook, Joe? It was actually a right uppercut. Then I followed the left hook. And, uh, yeah, they didn't get to capture it, but. Right then, are you thinking, this fight's over? I've won it? I think at this point, I was just happy that I survived that round. I mean, <laughs> he just came out so aggressively. My biggest concern was, could he keep this up for three rounds? For that. Yeah. But you can see the subtleties that, you know, a lot of people don't see. Every time I finish... With my punches, I keep chopping away that leg. And you're going to see how that adds up as the fight goes on. He tries blocking it. But as a power puncher, you put all your weight on your legs so you can't block the low kick. So coming into this fight, the plan was to keep that good head defense and then just keep wearing him down by chopping those legs. This is a cool moment to me. This is the last 10 seconds here. So we kind of sit down and you're going to watch my reaction here. Yeah, see, I kind of give him that stare as I go back to the corner being like, now now I got your respect. Canada's you in this mofo. Me. Yeah, now you better respect this Canadian. All right, so, but you only had eight professional fights when you took that bout. Do you think they kind of brought you in to face this guy as almost like meat to the lion in his home country? Well, absolutely. I mean, they want me to get beat. I mean, it's set up for him, and at that point, go Kensaki. So, I mean... They wanted me to lose, and I just think that based on my record, my experience, it was kind of a gift for him um, in his hometown. But like I said, I knew something different at that point. And when I heard I was getting matched with them, my, my reaction, I didn't know, like, I thought they were crazy. First, I was like, really? Are they even going to sanction that? And then the first thing I did was I looked at my coach and I said, can I beat him? And he goes, yeah. I said, all right, let's do it. And that was it. Wow. I just had to ask my coach. He gave me the nod that I would beat him, and then we signed the contract. All right, so what was the thought process in between rounds? Well, round two, I knew he was kind of wearing down and my kicks were working. So this time it was kind of just to fight him back a little bit more. Try to be first, put the combinations together, but always finishing with the leg kicks. And the thing was, which, which was impressive with these experienced guys, that they're the toughness of their body. I mean, if you fought someone with 10 professional fights, they probably would have went down with those low kicks a lot sooner. But from the years of experience, your body kind of creates this denseness, this toughness that you can take more punish it. And he took a lot. How was that crowd? Um, at first, they were you know, very quiet for me. And then uh, a few points of the fights, you hear them chanting his name, trying to get him going. But if anything, that kind of motivated me to keep going but always back to those low kicks you're gonna well, see too it, with his head forward it kind of opened up my uppercuts as well so my corner was kind of yelling for me to mix the uppercuts it's interesting that he continued to come forward even though you just kept pushing him back yeah and he kept headbutting me on the way in too i had a huge uh, bump on my forehead after that fight he just kept entering with his head i mean he got warned once but Already you can see his output, the power isn't there. Still has the power to kind of push me back, but at this point now I'm going to kind of set things up a little bit more, change my levels and angles. We don't, we don't usually see you fight going backwards all that much. Are you comfortable doing that? Uh, no, my style is, is pressure fighting, so I kind of stay in your face, but you notice when my opponent throws, I kind of slightly step back sometimes to kind of keep my range, and then I'll attack back in, but... I'm all about com throwing the combinations, blocking, and then throwing another combination. But that's when these uppercuts are starting to fly again. Oh, man, you're just working them over. And, and this thing, that's the, one of the big mistakes a lot of kickboxers make. When they get hit, they keep their hands shelled to them. And he let me just continually hit him because he kept his hand shelled to him. But boom, that double oh. uppercut. Yes. 
Snap wow. that head. That was the beginning of the end. Is that what you felt? Oh, yeah. Once I knew that uppercut landed, I knew he was slowing down. And look at the way he's laying on me at this point. He's falling. I knew his legs were going to be sore. So at this point, I know I had to kind of change levels a little bit more, try to be creative. And this is one of my favorite knockdowns right there. Oh. That's probably one of the favorite knockdowns in my career. Hands down. So you can when, watch this replay after. It's just the way I held his head back. It's, kind of, it's called a frame. So you frame him with one hand, and with my Taekwondo flexibility, I was able to get that round kick up to the head, but all set right. from the low kicks. I wasn't happy about this, by the way. As he's hurt and beat up, they take him to the corner to wipe his nose when there's like a few seconds left, and he's limping. So I should have been able to finish him right there. Oh. Wow. Yep, and that's where I proved everyone wrong about the low kicks. But you can see just how much time they gave him. I mean, I understand. Yeah, he's in his home country. Look at that. Yeah. That woman wants to kill you. I think the whole crowd there. And that was one of my biggest fear. I heard how passionate of fans they are in Turkey. So I was a little nervous to kind of go out of that arena. But you can see in the post-fight interview that you know, they were just really happy that uh, I was respectful to the whole audience and country. But you yeah, say that's one of your knockdown. favorite knockdowns, that head kick. Ooh. What is it that, that you love so much about it? Well, it's the distance I threw it in. Like, look how close range it is. To get your head kick up that high from still yeah. touching someone is, is almost really tough. So I kind of held the head with like a nice T. The ball was there, and I just went right over and got that knockdown. Wow. So what was the post-party, post-fight party like in Istanbul? It was actually cool. Is is what happened was uh, like we tend to do in a lot of events. The uh, the party happens at the hotel, so I got right. to celebrate with a lot of my favorite people. I was there with Gokan Saki. I met Big Mike for the first time, and to me, it was kind of cool to to see these guys that are big legends of the sport kind of compliment me on my effort and just you know like there's Gokan Saki, there's Daniel Gita, there's Big Mike. So at that point in my career, it was uh, a huge moment to just sit there win and get the respect from now my colleagues well here we are round three it's about to be party time yeah it, it's all about go i knew i had him hurt and then whoosh, i mixed that spinny hook kick that's those are the strikes you want to get to finish with if i would have hit my heel on that temple it would have been a nice highlight that'd still be playing are you, you still thinking this here, guy's dangerous at all or are you thinking it's a lamb to slaughter finish finish and what's honestly made this win even better for me is that I made him quit his corner had to throw that towel in and I mean even thinking back to a lot of the glory fights I can't remember many glory fights um, that ended with the corner throwing in the towel that's a right. historian John O'Regan question we're gonna have to ask but you don't really <laughs> see the towel throw in anymore and there's my boys Derek and, yeah. Joey and Matt who were there with me my coach couldn't even make it to this fight so I mean, even though he gave me that confidence that I could beat him, when the time came, I mean, with family stuff and he had kids. And so I was just a, a young kid from Scarborough, no experience, no one knew me, packed the bag with my training partner, not even a coach, and flew all the way to Turkey to, to do this. Now, I know your dad's as close to you as anybody. He's a huge kickboxing fan. What was that phone call like with Pop? Oh, yeah. I think after was always the best. And even the fights my dad came to, he would always, you know, call my mom right away, give her the phone so she can hear my voice that I was OK. But, uh, yeah, I think that was the only glory fight that my pops wasn't there for. Yeah. So, I mean, but great experience. Still to this day, people ask me what was the one of my favorite places I traveled to. And I got to say it was Istanbul. The fact that I got to start with glory there have a performance like that it's uh definitely one of my favorite places in the world now i need to go back and enjoy turkey and eat all their food because i was cutting <laughs> at that time and i didn't get to eat so i'll be back all right we'll look forward to working with you again my friend and thanks for taking a walk down memory lane ah, no problem buddy all right let's transition now to amsterdam who doesn't want to go to amsterdam and the red light is on for dennis corman who's live he's our Glory Fighter Correspondent, you know these guys very well. You shoot all of our video. You host the only live televised podcast in the entire country where they are kickboxing mad on television. What's going on, my man? Well, first of all, the red lights are off in Amsterdam uh, at the moment, as they are all around the world. Um, just to cut back to the Feltolini thing, I want to give my big props to, uh, to Bazooka Joe, what a beast he was in the ring. That referee you saw in the ring with him there is Joe Ubida. 
uh, probably the most famous referee in Holland. He was hospitalized last week with uh, cerebral hemorrhage. Uh, spent about a week in the hospital. Uh, he just got out, so I hope he's doing well. And I just want to wish him well on his recovery. So uh, that being said, back to your question. Uh, yeah, all the fighters here in Amsterdam or in Holland are on lockdown. All the big gyms are on, on lockdown. So all the fighters are trying to stay creative in their training, uh, in their backyard, if they have a backyard, or otherwise inside, uh, running in the park. And you see everybody popping out outside on, on the most awkward places uh, now. Um, of all these fighters, uh, one guy who we're going to talk to a little bit later is probably feeling the most lockdown of all the fighters because he had maybe the biggest fight in his life coming up. Like I said, Myrtle Kroonhart, the, the interim welterweight champion, looking forward to his fight with Cedric Dumbe. That fight was supposed to happen last month in Antwerp. Um, at first, they were looking at maybe to let it continue without audience. That didn't happen, and now he's just waiting for a new date, trying to keep ready. When that date's going to be, we don't know. Uh, so far, they shut everything down until June 1st, and everybody's eagerly waiting to see what the government's going to do after June 1st. Are we allowed to open the gyms again? Uh, are we allowed to have uh, uh, events with audiences again? We don't know. We have to wait another month. Uh, in the meanwhile, there's a petition going around in Holland from big gyms like Hammers Gym, Coliseum Gym, Mike's Gym. Uh, and, and a lot of other gyms are signed to, to open back up the gym, especially for fighters to have like adjusted trainings uh, on, with the social distancing. So kickboxing training and everybody standing like one and a half meter away from each other. I don't know how that's going to work, but they're trying something anyway. Uh, as I said, Berto Kroonhardt also trying to keep busy, trying to keep creative. Uh, he sent me a little video, which you're going to see in a minute, with him and his brother Fernando doing some uh, funny TikTok dance. In his backyard, he, luckily he has one, so he can train in his backyard. And afterwards, he told, talks to me a little bit about how life in lockdown is for a fighter. Baby, when you talk like that, you make a woman go mad. So be wise and keep on reading the signs of my body. Yeah. So there's nothing much you can do, you know. I miss kickboxing a lot, so every morning I, uh, I train. Nothing much to enjoy instead of my kids. So, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, basically that's what I'm doing now a little bit. So TikTok, enjoy with my kids. And uh, yeah, definitely I miss kickbox a lot. But as soon as uh, everything is done, I will definitely get back uh, back in a hard training camp. And as soon as Glory and, uh, starts the event with me and Dumbay, I'm ready to go. I'm ready to go so uh, that's it so everybody stay safe and uh hopefully see you soon in the uh, in the nearby future thanks now that's the access that only you can give us dennis i loved it i like the haircut by the way Todd. looks good on you all right buddy thanks for checking in that is dennis corman live from amsterdam now we go to the United Kingdom and a coronavirus survivor. Thank God he's with us still, John O'Regan. John, I understand you have some interesting historical information to share with us. <laughs> right, so we're gonna uh, we're gonna have a little bit of trivia. I've got a few questions for you guys, for the fans at home. Uh, it's actually glowing knowledge. Three fighters that are currently active: Jamal Ben Sadiq, Jafar Wilness, Marat Gregorian. They all debuted on the same event. Right, they're the, they, those three guys. They're the longest served guys on the roster. They all debuted on the same event way back when. It's actually amazing how far back it was. Okay. Okay. All right. Go ahead. I'm gonna go with I'm gonna go with Glory uh, Glory Four. No, it's gonna be Glory Two Brussels. Close. Okay. The answer is Glory Two. Glory Two Brussels. Wait, wait. Glory Two. Or glory you four? said Four. Glory Two. Glory Two. Glory Two. Four. Second ever okay, Glory event. Excited. But you can be excited for me, the debuts of Jamal Ben Sidi, Jafar Wilnes, Marat Be excited for me. We're colleague partners. Be excited for me. Joe got it right. Okay, next. Out of all the places in the world that Glory's been, which city has Glory visited the most? All right, let's say it at the same time. Ready? One, two, three. Amsterdam. Amsterdam. Nope. What? No, you'd be surprised. It's not in Europe. It's not in Europe. Hold on, hold on. Uh, Florida. No, 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 I know it. Go on. It's Chicago. 
But he's indeed yeah. Chicago. Chicago. Been there seven times. Seven. And the last one. Which one, former one. champion began his glory career with four consecutive stoppage victories? Champion? Former glory champion began his glory career with four consecutive stoppage victories. Come on, Grisham. Come on, buddy. Joseph Bartolini. It. it is indeed. Joseph. Yeah! Bazooka Joe. Joe. Yeah. Came Bazooka from nowhere. Joe. You know, that's really nowhere. Really to go four and zero. Impressive, four impressive runs of any professional kickboxer ever. If you look at the amount of pro fights that he had, uh, you know, before he got his title shot, before uh, before he uh, won the belt, he was um, very, very quick run, very quick run, very impressive run. Yeah, our very own Joel Valtellini. All right, Joseph Valtellini. I was thinking heavyweights at first. I was like, no, nah, it's not Rico. I was like, did Simi Shield how long did? No, and Joel. Was Joel was stopping it. guys. Joel was stopping guys. You know, back then people were saying that there was there was nobody from North America that could hang with Europeans, yeah. but. Joe came out of there stopping guys, so yeah. I only had right, one Joe, before, decision, buddy. John, before before we get out of here, I know you have some news and notes for us. Yeah, so uh, we have um, the June twentieth event with with Bader and uh, uh, Benjamin Adiboye. That's being postponed. Uh, you know, conditions in the Netherlands. We can't stage live events right now. Um, it's in lockdown, the same as countries all over the world. So we've had to postpone that. So we're just looking for a new date for that. Um, you know, the mood isn't bad in the camps. They kind of expected that fight was going to get postponed. So they were training hard, but with the expectation the date was going to get moved. And uh, the other thing I was talking recently with uh, Jamie Bates, also from the UK, uh, welterweight. And uh, Jamie, in his last fight, he he beat the former welterweight champion, Harut Gregorian. And uh, Harut was ranked number two in that fight. And with that win, Jamie's elevated to number four. And Jamie's telling me... Um, you know, he was looking at like top four fights and, and now he's saying, you know what, I want a title shot. I want to fight the winner of the, the upcoming worldweight title fight between Cedric Dunbe and Myrtle Grunat because why not? I just beat the former champion, you know, who was ranked number two in the world. So that win should mean something and I want to parlay that win into a title shot. And I have to say, you know, why not? I don't disagree with the guy. He's not, you know, he's not the biggest name out there, but he was, old man. There's always so many guys stepping up to take that title shot and Jamie Bates thinks it's his time now. So maybe he gets that shot this year. Let's see. Yeah, it's certainly uh, always a murderer's row in the welterweight division, one of the best in glory, if not the best. John, thanks for the time. I want to thank all of our guests, Joseph Baltolini, John O'Regan, Dennis Corman, and, of course, you for checking out our first ver version or edition of Inside Glory Lockdown. I'm Todd Grisham. We will see you next week right here.